2000's Godzilla vs. Megaguirus, or its original Japanese name, Godzilla vs. Megaguirus, the G-Extermination Strategy. Despite a mixed critical response in Japan, American critics loved the return of the old Godzilla. Not since Godzilla 1985 had a Japanese-made Godzilla film been released in that many U.S. theaters, though some confused Americans thought Godzilla 2000 was a sequel to the 1998 Emmerich film. Either way, Sony was skeptical they could get the same results with another Japanese Godzilla film, and so they would take a wait-and-see approach on distribution. Toho was aware of this, and so they decided to just target Japanese audiences, not banking on a wide U.S. release. For Godzilla's 46th birthday, producer Tomiyama would have Kashiwabara and Mimura return to write the story, but Takao Okawara would not return as director. This time, Masaki Tezuka would sit in the director's chair. Tezuka was assistant director on Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, and more recently was the assistant director for two of the Mothra trilogy films. Kenji Suzuki, with his love of green screen effects, would return as special effects director. The previous movie story was co-written by Kashiwabara and Mimura. According to Mimura, director Okawara seemed displeased with their effort and ended up rewriting some of the scenes himself. The final scene was apparently heavily reworked by Okawara, and this frustrated both the writers. The process of how the story was written bothered them as well. We divided the story into four parts. Mr. Kashiwabara wrote Part A and Part C. I did Part B and Part D. Then we put them together to complete the whole story. After the movie was completed, we realized this writing process did not work well. Kashiwabara would also weigh in on Okawara's changes. The director wanted to use his own ideas, so he gave many opinions about the script. I didn't like the director's ideas. Mr. Mimura rewrote the final draft of the script. I tried to quit the production. I don't think Mr. Okawara understood entertainment. He didn't know how to make action scenes work or look real in entertainment movies. For example, in the last scene, if someone slid down an elevator shaft without gloves or a towel, his hands would get burned. So this time, learning from their mistakes, there was a new director and the movie was only divided into two parts, with Kashiwabara writing the first half and Mimura writing the second, and it would take about four months to complete the story. Well, this is my first viewing of this film, so here we go. The movie starts off with an interesting retelling of the 1954 Godzilla raid on Tokyo, except it's the new Godzilla suit being digitally pasted in, and it actually looks great. Chroma key is a lot of fun. Besides some of the Americanized Godzilla films, this is the first I can recall where there's a narrator. The narration was done by Yusaku Yara, who is also known as the voice of Senbai Nuramaki from Dr. Slump. This is basically the same suit design, but this time it was altered with suit actor Tsutomu Kitagawa's body size in mind for comfort. Just like Godzilla 2000, this movie has its own continuity, this time with an altered history of the original 1954 film. In this continuity, Godzilla was never killed in 1954. Japan rebuilds Tokyo but moves its capital to Osaka. In 1966, Godzilla would return, this time drawn to Tokai's nuclear power plant and feeds off the energy. The debate that follows is a direct reference to the original film. The angry lady is even dressed the same. And I think I spy a Dr. Yamane. Nuclear energy then becomes illegal in Japan and through years of research, the country turns to plasma energy. Without any atomic power plants, Japan was safe from Godzilla, until 1996 when the King of Monsters returns. This time in Osaka, seemingly now drawn to the plasma reactor. For some mind-boggling reason, they send a team of commandos with rocket launchers. Like that's gonna do anything. Outside of those rockets carrying the anti-nuclear bacteria like Goro Gondo used in Godzilla vs. Biolanti, this just seems pointless. Predictably, many of the soldiers die, including their commanding officer. Tsuji Mori, played by Masato Tanaka, is an unoriginal character type that we've seen before. Someone with a personal grudge against Godzilla due to the monster killing someone he or she cares about or works with. In this case, it's her commander. This, of course, can get tiring, but she's a cutie, so who cares? Five years later, Sujimori is now part of the G-Graspers, another anti-Godzilla group like the G-Force before it, with the goal of tracking slash killing the big guy. They bring in inventor Hajime Kudo to their team, played by Shozuke Tanihara, and they hire him to complete the Dimension Tide, a satellite-mounted weapon that shoots a miniaturized black hole intended to imprison Godzilla for all eternity. Mimura would be the one who came up with this weapon idea. 
I was trying to come up with a most unexpected weapon against Godzilla. I thought it was impossible to destroy Godzilla with any weapon available today. Yuriko Hoshi, a cutie herself in the Showa era days, makes a return to Godzilla as scientist Miss Yoshizawa, and her character invents the Dimension Tide weapon. It's the testing of this weapon that accidentally allows a prehistoric insect to make its way to our time, laying an egg and setting the stage for this movie's monster villain. A young boy named Jun, played by Suzuki Hiroyuki, finds the large blue egg and brings it with him to Shibuya before deciding to throw it down a sewer. The egg begins splitting apart into more eggs, and as time passes, the sewers of Shibuya start to flood onto the streets. There's a brutal and gory scene with one of the dragonfly nymphs killing a couple. At times, this film has a horror feel to it. One of the next times we see Shibuya, it's completely underwater. And this is a little odd, because we don't see the moment when that actually happens. It's just completely flooded, and maybe that was for the best, as a scene like that would have taken a chunk out of the budget. Meanwhile, Sujimori and her crew use the Griffin, basically this movie's version of the Super X, to get Godzilla in position to be hit with the Dimension Tide weapon. But out of nowhere, thousands of flying insects which hatched in Shibuya start to attack Godzilla and absorb his nuclear power. Personally, I hate bugs, and I think we all hate mosquitoes, so we can all sympathize with Godzilla in this scene. This part is done well, mixing the CG insects with the practical ones that Godzilla smashes. Also, seeing Godzilla on an island again had me thinking back to Ebera. I was waiting for Godzilla to use his atomic pulse attack, but I guess this Godzilla doesn't have it or chooses not to use it. The Dimension Tide successfully locks onto Godzilla and fires the miniature black hole. Somehow, Godzilla is able to survive, and I guess it appeared to have missed, I think? In my opinion, the movie doesn't really do a good job explaining why Godzilla is able to survive a black hole, other than him just being Godzilla. Some of the dragonflies, or meganolas as they're called, survived as well, and they transfer their energy they got from Godzilla to their queen's cocoon in Shibuya. The queen emerges as a godzilla meganola hybrid, Megagirus. Megagirus is based on the real-life prehistoric insect genus Meganora. Besides being absolutely disgusting, the monster can fly at Mach 4 speed that produces high-frequency waves that short-circuit electrical equipment, and it creates an immense noise that's painful to the human ear. It has a long tail with a stinger on the end that she brutally uses on Godzilla, and even uses that absorbed energy to fire a devastating energy ball at him. So Megagirus and the Meganula are actually both adapted from Meganulon, which first appeared in the movie Rodan. The movie is a little slow getting to this throwdown in Tokyo, but the battle has some funny and creative moments that harken back to the Showa era. To some fans, Megagirus looks like an obvious Batra copy. This visual right here doesn't help. Unlike Batra, Megagirus uses its speed to take down Godzilla, not a giant Ferris wheel. I love the part where Mechagirus drives Godzilla back and crashes him into a building, showing how strong the kaiju is, but it also shows what an asshole it is when it smiles before knocking another part of the building onto Godzilla's face. He even has to shake the cobwebs off after. If that wasn't lighthearted enough, the monsters then clash in a samurai-like duel. Cunningly, Godzilla uses its dorsal fins to chop off one of Megagirus' claws. There are parts of this fight that honestly resemble an anime. The monster then uses its speed to confuse Godzilla. Unfortunately, the special effects don't pull off the execution of the speed well enough, but there are some shots that hold up okay. Winged monsters are notoriously difficult to use in these movies. Getting the wings to flap in a way so the monster doesn't look like it's floating on wires is tough especially when all the shots with Godzilla in it are slowed down to give the appearance of size, so the wings get slowed down as well. Even with over three decades worth of technological advancement, Eiji Tsuburaya's work in Mothra vs. Godzilla still does a better job at making realistic looking wings have realistic movement. Critics would go on to lament the special effects work in this film in general labeling it as cheap looking, with the miniatures not appearing to have much detail in them. Toho did tighten the reins on the budget after Godzilla 2000 Millennium didn't make a lot of money. The shining moment for the special effects team does come when Sujimori rides Godzilla's back, a very impressive cinematic feat that for the most part still looks good. A couple of times we see Godzilla in the role of horror movie victim.
this part here reminded me of Alien. But Godzilla isn't a dumb horror movie character. Michiru Oshima would create the musical score, and its best moments are during the final battle, with an intense but not obnoxious score. Megagirus' stinger is able to pierce Godzilla and his atomic energy is siphoned before he rips the stinger out and plants the giant insect in the ground. Nowhere to run now. In honor of Kitagawa's Super Sentai work, Godzilla pulls off a flying body slam. Megagirus emotes again. She knows that's a lot of lizard that's about to fall on her. And as all of us Pokemon fans know, Body Slam is a devastating move. Here, do it right, you. Give it the Body Slam! The Super Sentai connections keep coming as well, with Megagirus being played by Minoru Watanabe, another veteran of the Sentai series. The suit was mostly used for close combat parts, and sometimes Watanabe only wore the upper half of the suit. I forgot to mention in my last video that Orga's suit actor was Makato Ito, and he was known for his role in Kamen Rider. People laugh at this body slam part, but I think the humor is all in the camera angle and editing. You could have easily cut this shot out here, and the scene becomes a lot less ridiculous. But again, I don't think they were afraid to be funny in this movie. The turning point in the battle comes here. Megagirus tries to back away, but it's good night the lights for Megagirus. Finally, he gets a good shot in, and just for good measure, another one. Godzilla is victorious, but just like the last movie, this Godzilla is also not content going back to the sea. In a desperate attempt to hit Godzilla with the black hole again, Tsujimori pilots the Griffin and has the falling satellite's black hole gun lock onto her. Don't worry, she survives. Godzilla does battle with the black hole and fires his atomic breath at it, which is just so ridiculous, but this is a ridiculous movie, so just go with it. Godzilla is seemingly gone, trapped for eternity. The G-Graspers celebrate. The movie ends with no signs of Godzilla except some reported underground tremors, but the credits roll with no Godzilla to be found. However, we would get something that we're more accustomed to nowadays, an after credit scene, the first in Godzilla history, and this would be director Tezuka's idea. It would be the last movie for this Godzilla suit design, but it wouldn't be the last time we'd see it or Megagirus. They'd both make a little cameo in a Japanese film called All About Our House in 2001. Godzilla vs. Megagirus would open in Japan on December 16th, 2000 and grossed approximately $10 million. It was a dismal showing and it got stomped by Disney's dinosaur at the box office. This was a noticeable decrease from Godzilla 2000 Millennium. It's funny how Kashiwabara helped write both 2000 and this film, and he hated 2000, but thinks Megagirus is well written. Audiences obviously didn't agree. An initial plot idea for Godzilla vs. Megagirus had astronauts finding Godzilla's bones on the moon. Maybe this had something to do with Godzilla and the black hole weapon. We'll never know. For a select few, Godzilla vs. Megagirus premiered in the U.S. at the Pickwick Theater on July 13, 2002 as part of the Godzilla Convention G-Fest. For the rest of the U.S., the movie premiered on August 31, 2003 on the Sci-Fi Channel. Like I said earlier, Sony was taking a wait-and-see approach on distribution, and considering its poor showing in Japan, they passed on this one. For the Sci-Fi Channel premiere, 10 minutes would be cut by TriStar, and they also felt the need to change an awkwardly dubbed line and managed to make it even sound more awkward. The original international version of this scene played like this. Bodybuilding, huh? What a waste of time. Uh, what's that? Why do you need to be fit when you're gonna make Godzilla disappear up his own butthole, huh? <laughs> Tristar thought it was a little too crude for TV, so they clunkily changed it to this. Why do you need to be fit when you're gonna make Godzilla disappear up his own black hole, huh? Bad dubbing moments are part of the Godzilla movie charm, I suppose. Alright, now that we got the film that I know a lot of Godzilla fans consider the worst of the Millennium Era out of the way, 
it's time for the movie that people consider the best of the millennium era. And I've only heard good things, so I'm excited. Next up is 2001's Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters All Out Attack. 